All right, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we're, we're gathered here, our first uh, discussion group for this year. And um, so let's all begin. We'll begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so just as we begin, that very prayer, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is one of the very oldest forms of the Christian credo, the Christian belief. And it dates from the very first century. And it literally means, I believe. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And this is the essence of our faith, that we believe that there is one God, one God in three persons. And that is something that many people have struggled over the years to explain. How is it that we have one God, but three people? And there's a, uh, there's a number of theologians that you can read, but at the end of the day, you and I, we will never be able to explain fully the mystery of the Trinity, what, what it means to have one God in three different persons. But that being said, imagine for a moment that you wanted to build a table. Now, what, what would you need to build that table? Well, first of all, you have to have the will. You've got to want to build the table. The will is an extremely important part of the whole process. It's going to direct everything that comes after. The second thing you need, material. You, you can't build a table unless you have maybe some wood, some nails, maybe some glue, maybe a saw. You need material things to build that table. And then... The next thing that you need is action. You need some some muscle power to put all of the materials together. So you need action. So if we look at these three things that we see within our own selves, we see that we as humans, we have wills. We have wills that tell us we want to do this, or we want to do that. And we have material that is available to us. The difference between the material that we have and the material that God had at the beginning is that we have to take material from what's around us. We cannot create things and the way that the early Christian church viewed it, it was called in Latin, ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. God made everything out of nothing. When we go to make the table, we're using material things that already existed. So that's the difference here. That's one of the key differences. So we have a will, we gather the material, and then we start using our muscle power to assemble the table in a form and fashion that fits our needs. The whole process then, we can compare with the Trinity. You see, God the Father, He represents the will. It is His mind. It's the mind of the Father that has a plan a plan for everything in the universe, a plan that stretches from the very beginning all the way to the very end. And this plan is his will, what he wants to happen. And then he has what we call the divine energies. 
these divine energies are a creative force and a life-giving force. Now, the creative force, we can identify that as being Christ. We see in the letter to the Colossians, Paul says that in Christ, all things consist and hold together. All things consist and hold together. Christ, he is the creator. He is the one who is the divine energy of God that created everything that we see around us. When we think of who Christ is, he is the person of the Trinity who married himself to the physical world because he took on a body. So he's intimately connected with all that was created. The Orthodox view the Old Testament as a 100% foreshadowing of Christ. So anytime we see in the Old Testament a reference to Christ, I mean, a, a reference to God, this is really references to Christ. When we see, for example, God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, the Orthodox theologian would see this as Christ walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. When we see God speaking from the burning bush, we would see Christ speaking from the burning bush. Why? Because Scripture tells us no man can see God and live. So when we see God appearing in the Old Testament, for example, when the three men were thrown into the fire and Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire and said, I see four, we would say that was Christ. That was Christ with them. So the Orthodox see within the Old Testament Christ present throughout the whole history. And certainly we're told that Christ was with God, the Father, from all ages, from the very beginning. He is eternal. But he has this unique connection with all created matter. He is what holds us all together. He is the creative force. And so we see Christ as one of the divine energies of God. We also see the Holy Spirit as a divine energy. And the Holy Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit is what, in the creed, we say the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. He is the one who animates the material created world. So our bodies draw life from the Holy Spirit. All living things draw life from the Holy Spirit. And if we look at life, we see an intimate connection with water. All life is based on water. The human body is 70% water. The earth has 70, 75% water. The Old Testament says that the Spirit of God moved on the face of the water. So we see this connection between his Holy Spirit and life. Holy Spirit, water. And breath. Now in Aramaic, in Hebrew, in Greek, we have the word for spirit, pneuma in, in Greek, or ruha in Aramaic. These words mean spirit, but they also mean breath. And it's interesting. God breathed breath into Adam, his Holy Spirit. 
into Adam. Breath and spirit have the same meaning. So our breath, our very life, is centered on the Holy Spirit. And this is important because one of the reasons we believe that the Celtic peoples were so enamored with Christianity when it was presented to them is that it it saw all of creation the same way that the Druids saw it. And the Druids saw God present within all created things. And it was something that drew the two together. It was the the teaching from the Druids that helped them Embrace Christianity. Our primate, Bishop Mark, says that within all of the ancient pagan beliefs, there's always a grain of truth. There's always a grain of truth that helps them assimilate Christianity, that helps them see Christianity as being the ultimate truth. And this is certainly the case with Druidism. So we we were converted. But this concept of the Trinity is a very fundamental concept for us to understand that God, although one, can be seen as three. Just like we as humans, we're one. I'm not three different people. I'm, I'm one person. But I have a will. And I can perform things. I can do actions with my body. I can speak. I can, I can saw wood. I can hammer nails. I can, I can take action with my body. But those actions and my will and my desires, these are all part of me. These are things that I do. And so when we think of God... It helps us if we can understand God as being Father, the divine will, and his divine energies, which come forth from him and act outside of him. Our will is inside us. Our actions are outside of us. The Father, if we look at him as being the will, his actions are what is outside of him. Holy Spirit, and Christ. So this, this is how we, we understand God as being one and yet three. And so when we do make the sign of the cross, these two fingers are down. They represent the two natures of Christ. Christ, who is the, um, the son of Mary. He's incarnate. But... He is also divine, so he has two natures. And we put these three together. They represent Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They represent the Trinity. And so when we make the sign of the cross, we do it with our three fingers together. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, And you see some people just with their hand like this, or and it it, it, kind of looks like they're shooing away flies or something. But... We do it very intentionally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and, and, and there's a reason, and that's the way that the early church taught it. We also teach the sign of the cross, um, the forehead, and then we go immediately to the left shoulder. I, I'm, I'm sorry, to the right shoulder. And the right shoulder signifies that this is Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father. So, forehead right shoulder, left shoulder, and then our our, um, midsection um, so that we make a full sign of the cross, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it signifies our belief in exactly what we have just discussed, that our Father has a divine will and he acts within this world by sending forth his two divine energies. Now, we cannot know God the Father because we're, we're limited. We're, we're finite. We're mortal. 
And our minds can't comprehend all that the Father is. And so we can't know him in his essence. But we can know him in the way that he works, in the way that Jesus and the Holy Spirit work within the world. So we know God through his activity, through his divine energies. And that's how we come to know him. So, we've talked a little bit there about the, 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 the triune God, the one God in three persons. We've, we touched a little bit on the Celtic Church, and I want to go a little bit more into the Celtic Church today before we, before we take questions. The Celtic Church, a lot of people say, well, you know, is that, is that related to paganism? Is it Wiccan? Is it, um, is it New Age? Is it, no, 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 no. The Celtic Church is called the Celtic Orthodox Church because it is the restoration of the Christian church that was placed in the British Isles very early on. The Christian church was present in the British Isles before the Romans came and started conquering. It was there first. And this was the Christian church that existed among the Celtic peoples. It wasn't a national church, so it wasn't the Church of Ireland. It wasn't the Church of Scotland. It wasn't the Church of Wales or of Brittany. It was the Celtic Church. It was the church among the Celtic peoples. We believe, now one of the things you have to learn about the Celts is they didn't like to write things down. In fact, they had this belief that if you wrote something down and your enemy got a hold of it, they would have more power over you than what they needed. So they intentionally did not write things down. Well, that made it very hard for historians to really figure out all that happened among the Celtic peoples over the many ages. But they are an ancient people, and they have traces. They've left traces in Austria. They've left traces in Turkey, Portugal, Spain, huge um, centers in northern Italy, in western France. Um, they, they were a nomadic people, so they had little communities spread all out, but they were very, very um, specific in not leaving a written history. So what we have basically are artifacts, um, uh, things that have been found that lead us to believe where they started. Some historians claim that they actually had their beginnings um, and amassed their initial wealth in the salt mines in Austria, what is now known as Austria. And many artifacts have been found in the salt mines that, um, th that show that this was perhaps the, the cradle, the initial um, beginning spot for the Celtic peoples, and that they, their nomadic life spread them from that, from that region. We don't know for sure. But the point is, they were the ones to whom the gospel was delivered in the British Isles. And it was done so, we believe, by tradition. This is things that have been handed down from century to century. That it was done so by St. Joseph of Arimathea. Now, if you remember, St. Joseph was the one who went and who begged Pilate for the body of Christ. And um, Pilate said yes. St. Joseph took down the body and gave Christ his own burial spot, which was a newly hewn cave uh, there close by Jerusalem, and that's where Christ was laid. Now, St. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy disciple of Christ, and he had made his wealth in the tin trade. He had a ship that would go to the British Isles. They would 
take the tent, bring it back to Palestine. And this is how he made his wealth. But his ship eventually was shipwrecked. And he made his way across France and up across the channel into, um, into the British Isles and established the first Christian community, we believe, in the very first century um, in Iona. And from there, Christianity began to spread. It was a monastic type of community that was established. So the monks would go, they would establish a small community and then begin to spread Christianity in that region. And then they would go and establish another monastery and so on and so forth. All of these were very locally governed. They had the community as the heart of their concern. And this is to be contrasted with the Roman vision. The Roman vision was global, universal, one emperor over everything else, and everything was centralized. It was a very different mindset. The Celtic peoples were very um, agrarian. They were local, small, um, and they lived generally from the land. They didn't acquire great wealth. They may have had vast swaths of land that they hunted and farmed, but they weren't wealthy. That wasn't their goal. And this fit very well with the early Christian community. In fact, there's a, um, a number of historians that, that have said that the first above-ground church was St. Mary's at Glastonbury. And so the first above-ground church in the whole world was among the Celtic peoples. We were the first people who didn't have to celebrate liturgy in the catacombs or in secret. We were free. And we remained free up until the 12th century. And there was a push to move the lands that the Celtic monasteries had into the hands of the more powerful bishops. And this was eventually done in the, in the 12th century. And at that time, the Celtic Church became what our primate likes to call sleeping beauty. She went to sleep, but she didn't die. You see, Christ doesn't let his loved ones just simply die. And in 1866, her lines of apostolic secession were restored through the intervention of an Oriental Orthodox bishop who came and consecrated two bishops to restore Western Orthodoxy, the Celtic line of Christianity in the British Isles. Now, she's still very small. She's still very poor. But she has a few things going for her. One, she's not connected to any political party, any political affiliation, any national anything. She's completely 100% independent. Number two, she is 100% Orthodox. She teaches and professes the exact same faith that was professed in the first century that has been clarified by seven councils, but it's the exact same. Nothing's been added. Nothing's been taken away. It's the same faith. It's the same faith. She's independent, and she professes the faith of Christ. When you look at our bishops, you're not going to see wealthy men. You're not going to see men who are chauffeured about in limousines. 
I'm not going to... In fact, I came upon my bishop one day hanging out his own laundry to dry on the clothesline outside his uh, monastery. These are simple, humble, obedient shepherds of the flock. And this is what we try to instill in all the members, that we are not to become rulers and great, powerful men, but we're to become servants, servants of each other, and that we're to have a love that exceeds anything this world can comprehend because we're to have the same love that Christ had for each of us. When we gather as community, we're going to be scattered. We're going to be far apart. But through Christ, if we are in Christ, then we're in communion with each other. We have to believe that. We have to hold that dear to our heart. So that's about as much as I wanted to cover today. Um, and I'm sorry for any of you out there who tried to connect but were unable to because of technological difficulties. But this has been recorded, and um, hopefully you will be able to uh, listen to it. And certainly, if you have questions, um, feel free to email me, and I will respond. And now, um, I'm going to end the uh, lecture part, and we'll go into our question and answers. So we just had our first question, and the question had to do with Christ and perceiving Christ as a divine energy or perceiving Christ as a person and, and trying to figure that out and trying to understand. Well, if we step back for a moment and we think of God as one, God is one, yet God has this interior life, just like each of us have an interior life. We think things. I may sit here and think to myself, wow, I wish I had a chocolate ice cream cone. But no one else sitting here is going to think, oh, wow, I wish... I had, uh, um, he, you know, no one else is going to sit here and think, oh, he is now wanting a, a chocolate ice cream cone. They wouldn't know that unless they had some idea that that is what I wanted. Now, the clearest idea that they could have would be if I actually went and made myself a chocolate ice cream cone. Then they would see, oh, that's what he wants because that is what he's making. So you see, the person outside of my interior life can glimpse into my interior life by my actions, what I do what I say, but they can't know my interior life the same way we can't know God's interior life. Christ, because he was incarnate, was the most specific revelation of God to mankind of himself. And so we saw what God is all about through Christ. Because we could see when he was healing people, when he was raising people from the dead, we could 
we could witness the words and listen to the words that he, he was saying. All of these were revelations to us about the internal life of God. But as for us, there's no way it is impossible for us to know God in his essence. We really can't know that. But we can begin to know God through his energies. And so we say that, in a way, Christ was a divine energy, the divine energy that's most closely associated with creativity, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, we can see active within the early church. The Holy Spirit giving boldness to the apostles to preach, even when they faced death, when they faced imprisonment. The Holy Spirit was there, active. And so this was also a revelation of God. God revealing himself through his divine energy, the Holy Spirit, the creative force. So this is, this is how we can perceive. So we, we, we can't really separate them. This creative force, this divine energy, this, this third, uh, the second person of the Trinity that we call the Son. It's all one. But we can see it is an energy because it emanates outside of that interior life of God. The same way with the third person, the Holy Spirit, emanating outside the inner life of God. So these are, these are energies that go outside, that, that work in the world. So the next question is, well, how can the Celtic Orthodox Church be in apostolic lineage if its restored lines were through the Oriental Orthodox Church? Well, this is, this is a, a difficult subject. Um, and there are many Eastern Orthodox lay people, and I, I say lay people because usually the clergy, they don't get involved in these type of discussions. I think there's an understanding that perhaps this isn't a healthy discussion to have. But generally speaking, when we see these objections, they're coming from the Eastern Orthodox laity. And the objection is, well, you're not in communion with Bartholomew, and therefore you have no sacramental grace, your sacraments aren't valid, and these are the claims that they are making. These claims, please understand, are very close to the Roman Church's claim that you cannot be saved unless you're in union with the Pope. And we, we don't ascribe to that. Most Orthodox, Eastern, uh, Oriental, uh, Celtic, um, we, we do not subscribe to the fact that our salvation is brought forth from a man who is a human, not Christ. Our salvation comes from Christ. The New Testament is very clear that Christ is the head of the church. Seven times, Scripture tells us, Christ is the head of his church. And we know that we don't have animals that have two or three or four different heads. Yes, there are Siamese twins, but that's an anomaly. And in those situations, th those are two separate individuals who have been conjoined by some malady that occurred in the mother's womb. But by and large, you do not see creatures with two different heads. And 
It is the same with the church. The church does not have multiple heads. It has one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ, we are in his church. And we have to humble ourselves and realize that it is Christ who chooses who is in his church and who is out of his church. It is not us who who choose, nor can we judge. We have not been set up as judges to say, oh, well, you're, you're going to hell, or you are damned, or you are a heretic even. How can we judge that? We can judge words. We can say the words you speak are heretical. We can say your actions are something that someone who's a schismatic might take. But to be a judge of the person, that's something we should not do. We're told, do not judge, lest you be judged. This is what we're told in Scripture. So then, how do we reconcile this? Well, first of all, we have to realize that the Oriental churches broke from the church many, many centuries ago, long before the great schism between Rome and the four other churches happened. The great schism, um, recall, was when Rome left the four churches, uh, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople, and separated itself from them. That was the Great Schism. But before that, when the the five churches were still united as one, at the time of the Third uh, Ecumenical Council, there was a misunderstanding. And through greater dialogue between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. This misunderstanding has has come to be seen now as something that happened because of lin- linguistic difficulties, a misunderstanding because of translations and things that were going on. But essentially, the two, the Orthodox and the Oriental, the Eastern Orthodox, I should say, and the Oriental, they... We're saying the same thing, but using different words to express it. And so this this schism that happened between those two, the Oriental and the Eastern, many, many, many centuries ago, is being healed. It's well on its way to being healed. And in fact, an Oriental priest can celebrate a marriage or a funeral, or something like that, within, for example, a Greek church. Because they've begun to restore. But it's hard to restore. You've got two different lines of saints that need to be reconciled. You've got different things that have to happen in order for that full union to take place again. But there is a recognition that the Oriental churches did not lose sacramental grace. That may not be an official promulgated doctrine, but that is the recognition, I believe, that is most common among Orthodox's great theologians today, a recognition that, no, there's still sacramental grace, there is still the presence of Christ within the Oriental communities. And so for this reason, the Celtic Church says when the apostolic lines of succession were restarted in 1866 by an Oriental bishop, that they were true, valid lines of apostolic succession through which sacramental grace flows. And to bolster this, it is my understanding that over the century, or century and a half now, that 
whenever consecrations were required for new bishops, that many times bishops from Eastern Orthodox churches or sometimes from even the Roman churches who were sympathetic to the plight of the Celtic Orthodox Church would join in as co-consecrators for the new Celtic Orthodox bishop, such that now there seems to be an overlay, an overlap of Eastern Orthodox lines, Oriental Orthodox lines, and even Roman lines of succession. We believe that sacramental grace is present within the Celtic Orthodox Church. And we trust in the words, and I believe this was uh, Bishop Schmemann, um, or maybe it was Bishop Ware, and I, I forget my source right now, but it, 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 it was said that, and I believe this is true, we do not know where the church isn't. We can only know where the church is. We don't know where the church isn't. And so we must be very careful when we point fingers and we call others heretic and schismatic. We don't know. We do not know where the Holy Spirit flows. We don't know for sure who Christ has chosen to be part of his church and not part of his church. We have another question regarding whether or not the Celtic Orthodox Church will ever enter into communion with the other Orthodox churches. Let me begin by saying that right now, the Celtic Orthodox Church has no political alliances. She has no wealth to speak of. She has no schools or great swaths of land or material wealth, nothing to boast of. She has very few members in comparison with the larger churches. So to approach unity at this state may be premature for her. She has an ardent desire to keep her spirituality, her liturgy, the the gifts that she's been given, and there is not a lot of bargaining power, so we sh- can say, I suppose, that she brings to the table. So, in order to a- to petition for unity, she would necessarily have to lose some elements of her identity. And I believe there's a reluctance to do so. So would she welcome unity? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't think she's willing to sacrifice her identity in order to have unity. If that makes any sense. I believe that's the end of the questions uh, for today. So uh, with that, we're going to close. I ask that uh, God be with each and every one of you and keep you through the coming week um, and that he make his face to shine upon you now and always and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. God bless you.